hey Tom, welcome uh, to the podcast. I'm so excited, you know, to have you, you know, on as a guest. You know, you were you were so stellar at the last, um, you know, AI networking summit in Dallas, and I'm just so happy to have you on the uh, on the show as well. So well, I really, I really appreciate being here, and the Dallas event was terrific. You know, for me, it's old home week. You know, I see colleagues that, yeah. that you know I haven't seen in, in years, but uh, but you know, a lot of familiar faces. So it it was a great event. And How thanks awesome. for uh, having me to your remote studio here in uh, uh, Chatham, Massachusetts. Right? Yeah, no, you're welcome. That is like so funny. Yeah, so for everyone listening in, uh, we didn't plan this at all, but both uh, Tom and I uh, are in Chatham, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, actually really very, very cool. We could have done this actually live. He's probably yeah. like a stone. Are we going to have an there. Onug event in Chatham? You know, we've had um, at Chatham's Bar Inn, uh, we would have oh, really? some, yeah, some exclusive. Dude, invite me to that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I will. Yeah. We've had some like private, you know, um, you know, gatherings there and, yeah. uh, and everybody loves it because like after it, like we've done fishing trips, you know, um, oh, it's spectacular. Shadow Bar's Inn is, is, is an iconic destination. I mean, really, I think it's, it's, it's very special. Like yeah, you that be more and, speed than that, right. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I think, um, uh, CBI and the Quasit, mm -hmm. you know, are both like phenomenal. So if, if, uh, anyone listening, if you're looking to come to like the mid Cape, um, yep. you know, and, um, and explore Chatham, two great places to stay, Chatham's Bar Inn and the Waquasset Inn, you know, you can't really get any better than that, you know, yep. class, yeah. you know, yep. five star class A, you know, kind of places. So I want to, you know, I want to dive in. Um, so first of all, like I've always kind of like um, been observing your career from afar um, and, um, and kind of cheering you on because you've made such a big impact, like in our industry. So I thought like, you know, it would be good to hear from you, you know, what you think were some of the big things that you did in your career and what, what kind of led you back, you know, to Cisco and to run the security business and, you know, and be, you know, an SVP, you know, and, uh, and one of the greatest kind of American corporations, you know, that, yeah. um, that we have in, um, in, in high tech. So, yeah. So yeah, sure. just a, a few minutes, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, well, so I'm, I'm, I grew up in Boston, hence the Chatham uh, uh, place, and I'm an engineer. Um, and then, wh what do you call that white stuff that falls from the sky here? Snow? Oh, snow. <laughs> I, um, yeah. So even though I'm a skier, I, I, I got tired of the winters, and I, I said, oh, I'm going to move to California to just see what that's like. And that was 34 years ago, right? So I kind of never looked back. So I live in Silicon Valley, and I've been part of the startup culture. Um, so I've done three startups and then three big company gigs um, and all in the kind of network infrastructure space. Um, and so the most notable startup was a company called Ironport. It's a spam filter. Um, it was acquired by Cisco in 2007. Yeah. And after that, I ran the security products at Cisco from 2007 to 2012. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about, Nick, the, the concepts haven't changed. Like the idea of integrating networking and security much more tightly, it, you know, it's an obvious need, yeah. right? Like everybody wants it. It's just the building blocks that we had to work with back in 2012 just didn't really allow a true integration. A network device and a firewall, which they were they had different underlying hardware, different architectures. And so it was kind of a square peg beats around hole situation. Yeah. That's fundamentally changed. So um yeah, so I left Cisco and I started a company called Bracket Computing, which was hypervisor security. It was acquired by VMware. And then uh, after that acquisition, I ran um, uh, network and security at VMware for five years. So NSX predominantly, right. but also Bella Cloud and Avi, which is scale software load balancing and Carbon Black in the end too. I picked that up. So um, um, yeah, and those are great companies. All of those that you mentioned, like both Avi Networks, really great, you know, kind of, um, they were like one of the first ones in all of the kind of the software defined function. Scale out um, software load balancers. And, and, and the world needs all of that infrastructure. And unfortunately yeah. with the change of ownership in VMware, you know, that calls into question the viability of, of a lot of those products. Mm. And so that's actually part of my narrative. So, you know, as I understood the details of what you know, sort of that new ownership math. I was like, mm, it's probably not for me. And so I was thinking about, you know, what's, what do I do next? And you, you can see from my pattern, big company, small company, big company, small company. So I was thinking, I take a bunch of sort of the, my uh, VMware engineers and let's go build. I think the world needs a next generation distributed system. 
like a, mm. a, you know, a new architecture of NSX, like a, a place where you could put little tiny baby firewalls everywhere, right? Yeah. You bed them right into the workload, put them right at the edges of the network, put them right next to the workload. And so as we started thinking about this and looking at it, I was like, you know what? This is the kind of thing that really Cisco should build. Mm. And so I uh, reached out to G2, who runs the products here, and we started talking and, and I was like, look, I'll come on one condition. I want to go build something, you know, pretty ambitious, right? A, a, a new firewall, a new network security device, not a firewall, yeah. distributed network security device that looks nothing like anything you've ever seen before, but built from the beginning to be integrated into the network. Yeah. And like I said, that storyline isn't radically new. What is new is the components we have to build on. So there's, there's three things that exist today. And you know, it's so funny, Nick, when you did your opening talk, it was pretty much the same talk track that I have um, mm. at, at the ONA keynote. Um, but um, these, um, the advances in AI create man device management capabilities that were just utterly out of reach in the mm. past. So we can build a very, very distributed system. We can build a, a system with a million enforcement points, right? Because you don't have That's to manage an enforcement point. You let an AI do that. Um, so, so AI didn't exist. Um, the second thing is, is in software, the interface into an operating system called extended Berkeley packet filter, eBPF. Yeah. If you spend some time on eBPF, eBPF is the future of networking, right? It's going to allow us to tie together one Kubernetes container to another, one VM to another. It allows us to see memory. It allows us yeah. to see each individual process like very, very fine grained controls that we can implement in eBPF and it's becoming a ubiquitous standard. So, yeah. so, uh, okay, clean. AI, yeah, AI management, eBPF to interface into the host and then advanced silicon that we can put into the fabric of the network, like a DPU, a data processing yeah. unit. Yep. And I used to run that DPU team at VMware, right? So we spent years working on these things, the chips themselves. So from Nvidia, AMD and Intel, these chips are wildly capable, like mm. you could run like a full set of layer seven security services at faster than line rate on several of these different uh, chips. The issue is that their software to do that, you know, has been lacking, right? And, mm. and the reason that is that the vast majority of these chips are going into the hyperscalers yeah. and the hyperscalers write their own infrastructure software. Yeah. So the idea was like, we will use these building blocks to build a distributed system for the enterprise, but we'll write the software kind of for everybody else. Right. And so, yeah. so, so, and that's what we call Cisco HyperShield. And that's what I was talking about at the, at the, yeah. At the, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's great. Like, you know, putting all those kind of piece parts together, you know, the advent, you know, of uh, uh, DPUs, uh, how fast, you know, they are so that we can actually do the processing faster than line rate and then yes. a whole new framework around software on how do yes. we control that? How do we, you know, implement these kind of mini firewalls distributed all across, you know, uh, I would think between the application and the user and the, yeah. you know, supply chain and between those, like yeah. the applications dependency right. map, like you know, IoT, all between those. OT environments, right? Like, you know, in a hospital floor, in a, in a factory environment, you know, next to the oil rig, wherever a device connects to the network, mm. we can put a very intelligent layer seven enforcement point. Yeah. And that gets super interesting, super, yeah. super interesting because you get these really fine grained security controls, right? The challenge with, the, with, with today's firewalls is that they live at the edge of the network right? and, and, and they don't have the granularity. Like, you know, if I've got a, a vulnerable Postgres server in my application fleet, a firewall, it doesn't know like that Postgres server from, you know, an active directory server. It's just like packets on the wire. Yeah. Right. But, but if you have a distributed system where you can put a little tiny miniature firewall right next to that Postgres server, now you can apply compensated controls, you know, in a very automated and very effective fashion. And, and in a zero trust model, this is what we have to be thinking, right? You have to yeah. assume the attackers are already in. So, so lateral movement is the name of the game. How do I stop yeah. them from, from hitting this Postgres server? Well, you got to like plug the vulnerabilities of that Postgres server, even though it's not touching the internet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a scary thought and, you know, it's probably the most best position posture to take, you know, that they are already in, you know, and so now uh, it's that's really practical all... reality, Nick, this, yeah. if you want to get into like, you know, sort of cyber, you know, sort of fear, 
we spent a lot of time looking at the nature of these attacks. And, and what was interesting to note is we, we focus on the attackers that are attacking an application, right? So if yeah. you remember like the United Healthcare thing, um, uh, that was a, a vulnerability in a remote desktop application that, that was exploited, very high profile. Hmm. What gets talked about less is that the infrastructure itself is vulnerable, yeah. right? Firewalls. So, sure. so hmm. the, the irony of irony is that the device that you're relying on to protect your infrastructure is being targeted by nation states. These are not amateurs. Uh, some of these yeah. attacks, we, we sit puzzling, like how the hell did they figure this out? You know, like, like mm. very, very, very sophisticated attacks. And Fortinet had a whole uh, bunch of high profile, uh, very uh, you know, severe vulnerabilities. And, and but I'm not casting dispersions because they're coming after Palo, they're coming after us, they're yeah. every firewall vendor. And the simple fact is, is that firewalls are hard to upgrade. And so, yeah. so customers are running code that might be, you know, 18 months old on firewalls and, and the software has bugs, right? And yeah. so, so they're taking advantage of that. So that, again, this is a paradigm that has to change. You can't be leaving infrastructure, you know, un, untouched, unupdated for 24 months, switches, yeah. routers, anything that touches the internet, that thing's got to be dynamically updated. And again, the, the, this is all possible with these new building blocks. It wasn't possible before. Yeah, well, that's a great prelude, you know, but it's like it, that problem is so asymmetric. You know, it's very difficult for any company um, to compete against a nation state. You know, they'll put they'll keep applying resources and resources, you know, to it to kind of crack in. Um, so it's like and then also just the, the, the sheer fact of how you manage all the rules within firewalls. You know, as they're kind of centralized, those rules grow. The people who set the rules leave. You know, you don't even know what's in those fun, those rules, you know. So it's like, so anyway, I think I love like, you know, your, you know, the, uh, the rationale. Okay, of why to come, you know, to Cisco and you want to do something big and something really useful uh, for the industry and the economy, the general global economy in general. And that's to create a more trusted infrastructure. Yeah. And this is one manifestation of that, you know, the yes. HyperShield. That's, yes. that's great. Yes. What, what, what we are building with HyperShield, and I know this will sound like hyperbole, but it's, it's true. It's, it's a firewall that writes its own rules, tests its own rules, qualifies mm. its own rules, deploys its own rules, lifecycle manages its own rules, and then mm. almost magically it upgrades itself. Right. And, and, and that's transformative. Right. Yeah. And that's just the beginning. Like all yeah. that stuff I talked about is working. I have the first customers are turning on like now. And so, so, you know, but what we can do with these building blocks, it, it, like we are going to go through the next 24 months are going to be like amazing, challenging yeah. because change is hard. Right. But like, you know, yeah. we're going to be producing systems that are so autonomous, so intelligent, you know, where I'm particularly interested is the intersection of security analytics and networking. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, yeah. so I don't know if anyone noticed, but we acquired Splunk. Yeah. Um, and if you talk to Splunk customers like I do, uh, I'm not a Splunker, so I can speak sort of, you know, innocently. I'll say, ask them, hey, what do you think of Splunk? Two yeah. things they tell me. First is we love it, right? Yeah. It's unbelievably powerful. What's the second thing you think they say? <sighs> Cost. It's really expensive, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. so, the reason it's expensive is not just software licensing, is that Splunk is a, a victim of its own success, is that it, it can ingest a petabyte of data and then answer, mm -hmm. you know, an ad hoc query like, hey, you know, tell me in a timely fashion, right? Like, tell me if how many IPs have connected to, to you know, this address. Yeah. Um, and so, so, so there's an interesting state as you start to look into the details of what goes into any SIM like Splunk. Mm -hmm. um, about half of your total ingest bill, all the infrastructure and everything, the storage, about half of that is firewall logs. So half. firewall logs wow. are, yeah, ha so it's wow. half. And yet that's a tiny sample of your total network data. Yeah. If you're thinking about that zero trust scenario I talked about, of like assume attackers in and they're going to be moving around. They're probably behind the firewall already. Yeah, well, for sure. You would so think. You got to look at yeah. east-west hops. And so we've done yeah. a, a fair amount of analysis that shows that, that to really understand east-west traffic and fine grain detail, that is three orders of magnitude more data than is currently being ingested, a thousand X. So yeah. it's not even practical to ingest all that data. But what we're thinking is rather than moving all that data to the analytics, we move the analytics to the data.
And so mm. with this distributed system, Hypershield is the control plane. But as we start putting more and more intelligent compute into the fabric of the network, we can identify lateral movement of an attacker and make a SIM like Splunk 10 times more effective without creating a giant data ingest build. So we can redefine the SIM market with this architecture. There's lots to do. That's, now that's, a, that's so, some, that kind of midterm, multi-year project, right? But, but it's a solvable problem. Yeah, but okay, so my mind is kind of reeling around from that concept. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like, one is that the way that I kind of um, internalize this framework and it, it, all sims kind of operate the same way, it ingests a lot of data from multiple different sources. It canonicalizes that data, all right? Um, and then it can uh, run, you know, uh, applications, analysis, you know, on right. top of that, you know, that data. Right. Right. So as we start to, and so it, at, that works, you know, and I think what you're basically saying is that, um, in order for us to like really scale to another level, we've got to really distribute that. And also too, it's like, you know, now the, you know, um, be able to, to really kind of fine tune and maybe identify posture and threats more quickly. It's got to be closer to like where actually the, uh, the so data and the applications the distributing, you know, are. Distributing analytics means you can do it without ingesting tons of data and moving tons of data, right? So there's an economic error. It also means it's, it's probably closer to real time. Right. Yeah. So like we see a connection getting set up, we see the process that initiates that connection. We see the process that terminates that connection. We can execute all that stuff like as that connection is, is taking place. And so it creates a much more timely response, which makes it more valuable and interesting. Yes. That's really that's interesting. So that's the DPU uh, piece coming into this. So we can actually do this in line rate. So uh, if you're doing it in line rate, you can actually then Correct. look at stuff in real time. Correct. And if you're moving it out, closer right. to where like the attacks might be happening, then you're kind of thwarting it and identifying it and mitigating it. Then you're kind of really thwarting it from penetrating deeper into like yes. the infrastructure. Yes. And, you know, and distributed okay. analytics is not, again, not a new idea, but the reason it gets more interesting is that we have the ability to process this stuff like a thousand times more effectively than, than, you know, we, we did just a few years ago. And, and, and AI is an essential part of this. Like how do you manage, yeah. 10,000 distributed nodes, each one of which is trying to make decisions on its own. Well, that's tough to do. Um, yeah. uh, but with AI management, like it gets quite reasonable. Like, hey, let's talk about 100,000 nodes, right? So now I make it sound easy. This is a very hard problem. Um, mm -hmm. But it's one of these problems where if you constrain it, it, it can work really, really well. So don't try to solve every aspect of it. But like if we can constrain it to particular uh, uh, attributes or use cases, um, it can be amazingly effective. And that's the approach that we're taking. Yeah. But that's awesome. all of this comes back to say like the, the, the fabric of the network is changing dramatically. Yeah. Right. The network is the thing that you trust. The endpoints get compromised. No matter what happens, endpoints get compromised. It's the network yeah. is the place that, 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 you know, trust exists. Yeah. And with this new kind of compute, we can bring processing into that network in a way that, that w what just simply wasn't possible. Recently. Yeah. Well, that has such a big ring of truth, you know, to it, because like really like the only data that you really can trust is network data, mm -hmm. you know, the state of the network and you know, that stuff just doesn't lie, you know, mm -hmm. and it can't be manipulated. Um, so it's, yeah. Okay. So uh, I had a whole series of kind of questions <laughs> and we're kind of, and I love I'm this gonna... format so much better <laughs> because yeah. we're kind of going, you know, we're, we're kind of going through them, but I do want to kind of touch on a couple of things. Yes. You know, one is, and we can still stay on, you know, kind of distributed, but like, so uh, there's two thoughts I have in that one there. Are, I think the overarching uh, theme there is, you know, how do you build trusted infrastructure, you know, for this next generation um, of workloads and the way that our corporations are becoming more and more digital and in there. So I think in the, in the, in the, in the hyper shield, I'm kind of thinking like two use cases are really jumping out at me. You know, one is micro segmentation and, and the big problem with micro segmentation has always been uh, management of it. Yeah. Um, so it's like, so, um, so AI can have a, a role in there. I think we vision AI can have a role in there. And then the second one is zero trust, you yeah. know, and zero trust, um, there are two parts, you know, of zero trust. One, there's the user experience, which has been cumbersome. Um, and then there's also identity. Um, yeah. So it's not just, you know, um, people and devices, but it's a whole range of things around identity. You know, like yeah. the folks who are in the OTIT, you know, world, 
um, you know, being able to identify all of those devices now that are that yeah. are out there, in addition yeah. to like the people and, and the devices that we're using. Yes. So why don't we uh, talk a little bit about those kinds of use cases as you're seeing yeah. them? And then yeah. I want to jump into like, you know, operations. Yeah. And totally. how now kind of knock and sock operations change <laughs> in this new world? Okay. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Does that work? Yes, it does. So, so let's start with segmentation. Segmentation yeah. is a foundational capability. You know, we've been segmenting networks for decades. Um, yeah. And as you pointed out, it sounds easy. It's actually hard, <clears throat> right? Um, segmentation is what I, I call it. It's, it. it stops the obviously bad traffic. Mm. So, so right. pick a pathway that should never be used and turn it off. Right. So yeah. like a web server should never SSH into a database like ever. Right. So, so yeah. don't allow that, that ha to happen. What yeah. gets tricky is, well, which, which application flows should you allow? And so the way the industry has been doing this, including me, my past life is um, yeah. we would baseline an application. So you want observe its behavior or you do flow analytics It's a very mature capability. Um, m multiple vendors do this. Uh, and you look at it over a period of time. And where that breaks is that applications are not synchronous. They're not time-driven. They're event-driven. Yeah. Yeah. So let's imagine I'm looking at an app that schedules the delivery of, of sheet metal in a factory. And I observe that app for 90 days. And I'm like, okay, here's a, a set of segmentation rules that I'm going to apply. These are all ports and protocols that should never be used and turn them off. Mm -hmm. um, if we run out of sheet metal on day 91... The app is going to do a bunch of things that appear random. It's not random. It's event driven, right? Yeah. So, 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 so that's why segmentation has been a challenge for most customers is that you're like, darn it, I make these rules and then something changes and then, and, and, and it breaks. But with AI, we can make that a, a dynamic learning process. The combination of AI and the, the fine grained visibility we get from eBPF means yeah. that we understand every bit of the pieces that make up an application, right? Mm. So we're like, oh, this is the web service. This is not just the web service. This is Apache version six service pack two, right? So you have, this is Postgres version four, right? So you know exactly what are the components of the application. And then you can start to look at individual behaviors. You can take the obviously bad stuff and say, look, I can say with high confidence that, you know, uh, uh, you know, this web server should never SSH into a database, right? So that one's easy. Yep. Yeah. And then you can make successively tighter and tighter policies based on your confidence of the behavior and understanding of the application. Now, if the application changes, if, if it gets to be motioned, um, if it uh, gets updated, like, oh, look at that. We went from version six to version seven of Apache. Um, we see that with eBPF. We will relax the rules, you know, go back to like yeah. a, a baseline understanding and then tighten them up again. So it's a dynamic system that yeah. behaves kind of like what a human was doing, you know, except that was trial yeah. and error, you know, that system is now automated. So segmentation can actually work and work at yeah. scale. And, and I'm always a believer of like, you know, think about two tiers of segmentation. Everybody pretty much already is doing, you know, some kind of VLAN segmentation in the fabric of All their right. network. Yeah. And that's your kind of course controls. Mm -hmm. And then the fine grain controls need to be done in software. Right, so yeah. eBPF uh, software-based segmentation and those two to work together. So, 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 yeah. so that that's that's fun, foundational. Now, you, yeah. as you said, like, okay, let's talk about zero trust. So, zero trust says, you know, you have to assume the whole principle of the zero in zero trust is like assume that an endpoint, any endpoint in the ent entity, is compromised. Yeah. So, so you want to put the least privileged access in place. I want to say, you know, Nick can only access the applications that he's entitled to access. And, and I want to make sure that those applications are properly protected. So what we see happen is that that attackers are getting very, very good at saying, oh, I'm expecting some sort of least privileged control in place. So I'm going to move through a legitimate application pathway yeah. so that I look like just like, you know, regular app traffic and I'm going to not violate a least privileged policy. So, so, and this is where I think there's a real opportunity in the industry is that if you look at the number of vulnerabilities in a typical enterprise every single week, it's like 500 to a thousand 
sometimes 2000 new CVEs every single week that have to be yeah. addressed. 2000 CVEs. And so wow. now <clears throat> the thing that's, that's, that's um, unsettling is that it used to be, well, yeah, it's 2000, but like only like a hundred of them are like super, you know, uh, dangerous and being exploited. Right. So I'll get to the other ones when I get to them, you do them all in one big upgrade kind of thing. What we're seeing happen in the industry is, is attackers are automating their processes. And so what used to take weeks to exploit a vulnerability, you know, recently became days and now we're seeing hours. Yeah. Even that, 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 um, you know, healthcare thing I was talking about, like, like yeah, that, United. Within, within hours. Mm. That that was that was that was that was that was two days. Okay, um, but you know, like we're talking about like very very rapid yeah. weaponization of vulnerabilities, and it's simply not reasonable to patch every application, you know, in one day. Like it's just not because yeah. you have to test and qualify patches, etc. So yeah, you got to run your business too. Yeah, exactly. Right, and so yeah. so so again, AI these building blocks allow us to, to do differently. So we we take the output of your vulnerability scanners. And we ask three questions. First question we ask is the vulnerability in question, is it running in memory? That's not really AI, that's eBPF. So we can mm -hmm. see into memory yeah. and say like, ooh, here's a vulnerability and it's actually present in memory, not on the yeah. manifest. Is it like mm -hmm. running in memory? If it's running in memory, we care more, right? Second mm -hmm. question is, is this being exploited in the wild? And here's where AI is amazing. Oh. Right. So we've got AI bots that are reading the dark web. They're looking at Git. They're looking, you know, at instant response logs. Is anyone either seeing this in the wild or are they talking about it? Sometimes just a vulnerability showing up on the chat boards is a good leading indicator. Like this thing's about to get popped. And yeah. so, so you can prioritize here are the ones that are actively being um, exploited. And then the last is since we understand the application, what is the business criticality of it? Is this customer data? Is this PCI data? Right. Roll all that up into a score and yeah. say, okay, we've got 2,000 Apache servers in our fleet, but there's 100 of them that have this new vulnerability that I call log 5J, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and if log 4J taught us anything is that, yeah, it takes a while to patch the, and qualify uh, the fixes. So app team, you go about in an orderly fashion testing this new uh, uh, patch. While you're doing that, I will apply a compensating control right up next to that app. Remember we talked about distributed system yeah. right next mm -hmm. to the application. I'll put a compensating control either in the eBPF layer in the OS mm -hmm. or in a server-based DPU or in a network-based DPU. And, yeah. and it's and not or, meaning like I could have a, uh, if there's no server Hopefully. DPU, like a network one, I could have the, the OS that could work together, right? We can distribute the processing, you know, around the topology of your enforcement points. So what we're talking about though, is the ability to automate the deployment of a compensating control so that it solves this, this uh, application vulnerability problem in a really unique way. And That's interesting. So like, I'm sorry, I, I stepped on you. Continue. No, 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 I was just finishing. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, I think it's a really cool thing because it's just not practical to be patching all these applications and yet they're being exploited. So what do you do? You know, like you, you know, I think that's a, a problem that that needs a solution right now, and this is a really clever one. It doesn't obviate yeah. the need to patch. Yeah, you still have to patch, but it's a, but it's, it's, a, it's a finger in the dike. You know, you plug the hole. Yeah. But it's prioritizing, and it's you know, and it's right. basically saying, hey, there's a there's a posture issue here. Uh, you know, based upon memory of the processors, based Correct. upon the chatter that we're seeing on the Correct. internet, and based upon kind of the application itself. Correct. And so, like, so that's actually that is very helpful for operations and the developers to say, "Oh yeah, dude. okay, what, it's what a human would do." Yeah. Except we 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 capture that decision making, you know, with the computers. Yeah, and you can see, like, you know, that next step. You know, like once you get trust in, you know, in that signature, you know, that score signature. You know, that becoming automated as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know? So now, here's the, I think the coolest thing we're doing is, mm -hmm. is it, it fits into that operations piece. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. I want to make a change. I want to put yeah. a compensating control in, or maybe I just want to change an access control list, right? Yeah. Um, you, you said this right in the beginning, like for most customers, their firewall rules or the ACLs, the list of ACLs that they have mm -hmm. is this giant cryptic, it's like assembly yeah. code, you know, it's like this, this table yeah. of numbers. You're like, oh my God, I have no idea <laughs> like, who put that in, <laughs> right? I don't like, I'm afraid yeah. that if I touch it, 
I, it, the other thing we're finding is like, even if I make one change to one, you know, sort of rule table, there's an unintended yeah. consequence. It's going to affect something else somewhere else. Yeah, you could have a Cartesian explosion on your hands or something. Yeah, you know, right. Like, I mean, that's that's reality of today's <laughs> network professional. And what's interesting yeah. is fifty percent of yeah. network outages is due to either misconfiguration or misunderstanding of the configuration. Right? The ASICs don't fail anymore. Like these things, yeah. I mean, they fail once in a while, but it's like very, very rare. Power yeah. supply is more likely. It's but it's you know the biggest issue is just human error, yeah. and and because these policies are so freaking complicated, and so so we have a really interesting approach here, which is everywhere we run one of these little miniature firewalls, we actually run two. So we run a, a it's called a dual data path. So oh. Yeah, oh. a digital twin. Yeah. And, and that allows you to test policy changes. So it's, mm. it's a full packet processing pipeline running in parallel. So packets come into the, to the, to the enforcement point, we fork yeah. them and then we run yeah. two, two parallel sets which yes, it uses like more compute, doesn't use more bandwidth because we do it in, in, within the, the system, but it uses more compute. But the, this compute is so fast that it, it's negligible in terms of it, it, the, you know, the cost. But the, the management it gives you is amazing because now yeah. I want to make a change. You have the ability to test that policy change on live traffic, yeah. not in a lab or a staging environment, everywhere. Mm. And you could have 100,000 of these little digital twins and yeah. so you're testing live on live traffic before you make a policy change. Yeah. So you know it's going to work. Yeah, you can see that's a, that's a great trust builder, you know, great safety net, you know, um, you know, there where it's like, you know, if you got like a thousand, ten thousand of these things out there and something breaks, man, it's like, oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's like right. that is not a happy day. Right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. So yeah. so so from an operations standpoint, this thing is beautiful because mm. you're right. Let's say you're running. Let's think about the software upgrade process. So we're running version mm -hmm. 2.0 of the firewall code. When version 2.1 comes out, you put it into the 10,000 digital twins. Yeah. And so you're running 2.0 in the primary data path and 2.1 in the shadow data path. And there's a local AI engine that's comparing the two. Yeah. Right. And it's saying these, you know, you, AI can compare two things that are not the same, but you can say, are these effectively the same, right? Like two different software versions. And then that presents the administrator with it, with an aggregated view of like, look, I've been running 2.1 on live traffic everywhere in your environment for a week. And I've had this many policy hits and this many, you know, flows and this many, you know, et cetera. And I think these things are the same. And then the administrator says, yes, go ahead. We, we cluster between the data paths. So in the Kubernetes world, this is what we call a blue green migration. We then just without yeah. taking the system offline, we move flows off of 2.0 onto 2.1. Now 2.1 becomes the primary. 2.0 is the shadow. You run that for five days. The AI engine says it's still the same. Yeah. We load 2.2. So this thing upgrades okay. itself. Okay. That's, yeah. So this is like awesome. So we talked about AI from how it can benefit kind of segmentation and micro segmentation. It's yeah. management thereof. Uh, yeah. Also around trust uh, and, zero, uh, and zero trust. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, also um, on the operation sides, we talk a little bit about patch management, you know, and yes. how um, AI can have a benefit, you know, there. I think we're kind of just scratching the surface on that one, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, because I'm sure like it can go even, you know, uh, much deeper. But like I think when you're we're talking about large infrastructure, you know, it's like you can't all of a sudden automate all this stuff. You've got to build, you know, building blocks that create trust within the operations people. So I love the digital twin stuff. I think that's a great trust builder and a really great yeah. safety net uh, to have as well. What else are you, so we didn't talk identity though. Oh you know? yeah, right, right. So let's, you know, yeah. so identity, especially around zero trust yeah. and the whole control plane, you know, yeah. for zero trust uh, framework, you know, that yeah, would yeah, be- totally. Thank you. This is a great topic. So you know. uh, networking people care an awful lot about identity. And sometimes you think, yeah. oh, it's, you know, like it's the identity access management guys are, Identity is way more than Active Directory, right? Yeah. So, so if you think about a firewall rule, it's it's IP port and protocol. That's what we used to call the five tuple: IP address, yeah. source and destination, you know, port, and then and the protocol. IP yeah. address was a form of identity, right? It was, it, yeah, kind of a bad one, right? But it mm -hmm. was a, it was a form of of, of identity. And so, yeah. so as I think about the world going forward, to make intelligence security decisions, we have a new five tuple it's actually a six tuple right we i want to know who you are i want to know that it's mm -hmm. nick yeah i want to know what machine you're on the posture of that machine the configs etc 
right? Yep. I want to know the third layer is I want to know what process, software process on Nick's machine is initiating that connection. Mm. Yeah. And I want to see that on the other end of the wire. So if you're connecting to an Apache server, I know it's Apache and and it's running, you know, sort of this OS and you know, and this is the software process that's terminating. So we want to see identity, yeah, you know, device and process on both sides of the wire. Hmm. So that and, all gets wrapped up into identity, right? So it's like it's it's that, me, are, it's my machine. More fine grained descriptors yeah. of identity. Yeah, right. It's like, because yeah. the reality of it is, these days with stolen credentials, like, for me to be like, yeah, it's Nick. He logged in. Mm. That's an incomplete view of what's happening, right? Because it could yeah. easily be someone's, you know, stolen a session, you know, hijacked a session token, uh, or they've stolen a password, right? Like, that's a very, very, you know, well understood uh, threat yeah. these days, right? And so, so, but if I can look at the individual processes on your machine and the behavior of those processes, and then correlate that in real time to the behavior on the network, it's extremely telling. So for example, yeah. let me be very specific. 80% of the ransomware attacks we saw last year started with an infected machine, hmm. which um, uh, had an unknown process, some new software process that in turn has just spawned out of PowerShell. Hmm. So, you can't say, oh, any process that spawned out of PowerShell is therefore bad because there's a lot of legitimate reasons why a new process has spawned out of PowerShell. But yeah. attackers are trying to look like legitimate traffic, right? So 80% of the ransomware attacks that we saw came from a new process that in turn had spawned out of PowerShell. And yeah. we have the ability to see that in real time. And so this is one of the coolest things we're, we're working on is, is when that machine... When that funny looking process that we've never yeah. seen before, right? It's not known bad and it's not mm -hmm. known good. It's like, like yeah. hmm, so it's new. I've never seen it before. You're not going to block it. When that goes to make a connection on the network, we, we let's say it's maybe a 10% probability it's malicious. We we'll say, yeah. all right, we're not going to block at a 10% probability, but we can see the destination that it's connecting to. And in real time, we're saying, you know what? Let's, 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 that's an important asset that it's connecting to a customer database or PCI database. And so um, uh, let's snapshot it. So we integrate with whatever storage backup solution you have, Cohesity, Rubrik, Veeam, yeah. right? They all have APIs. We take a snapshot and then we watch. Yeah. And if it turns out, oh, that was just a Windows update. That's why it was a new process. Oh, we took a snapshot of the target and throw it away. But if it turns out that's ransomware, we just automated the ransomware recovery process. Right. Yeah. And I believe with, you know, a little bit of experience with this and some maturation, we could say we could automate that back to a recovery point of zero, meaning, Nick, I'm really sorry you had a ransomware infection. Good news mm. is you didn't even get sick. Yeah. It becomes like a vaccine for ransomware. Yeah. Right. Yes, you're going to get infected, but we can back you up, you know, before one line of encrypted data was written or if, if the attackers are moving laterally before they're able to put any executable code and, and, and pivot. That's huge. Yeah, huge. That's right? huge. Yeah. That's that is all 80%. based on identity. You need to yeah. understand who the user is, what device they're on, and and software process level identity is going to be the future. Yeah. Again, hard problem. Lots of processes yeah. out there, right? So that like the amount of data we have to process is is, is big, but very solvable. And we're doing yeah. a lot of that today. Like, the, like everything I just described is is young, but like mm. shipping. Yeah. So yeah. what about like um, non human uh, identity? Like uh, not just the machines, you know, but like, you know, we have sensors out there and um, totally. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the other side of the wire, right? You have to understand yeah. all the devices, not just, the, not just the humans. Yeah. And, and it's much harder because like the, the, the non-human stuff doesn't raise its hand. Right. So we have yeah. a, a capability at Cisco that is pretty mature called the identity services engine. And it's the ability to say like yeah. any entity yeah. when it's connecting mm -hmm. to the network, you got to register dot one X, whatever, right? Whatever authentication. And then yeah. now I know who you are and I want to put tags on your traffic. Mm. And that's really good. That is really, that's yeah. the, I think that's the only practical and workable answer to that, to the, to the non-human machines is, is like, just tag it. Now, okay. as mm. the infrastructure gets smarter and smarter and we put DPUs closer and closer to the edge, we can do a whole lot of inspection and, and, you know, compensating controls and everything right at the edge. But when you put a tag on, you can do that enforcement anywhere in the network path by reading the tags. Yeah. 
So okay. packet tagging, I think is going to be, you know, it is already here. A lot of folks on this call already do it. Keep doing it. It's going to be really, really important and valuable um, uh, for managing IoT. Yeah. The other thing and I think is, is just controlling access to a server is, I think, a really interesting area. Um, uh, if you look at 80% of the um, lateral movement that I, we did a study um, a couple of years ago, 80% of the lateral movement, 80% of the time they were using remote desktop protocol, RDP, as yeah. the vector for lateral movement because nobody blocks RDP because that's what your sysadmins need to get in and manage the system. We can do much better than that, right? Like, mm. don't you be randomly RDPing into a server, right? So we can put controls, again, identity-based controls in place to, to have conditional access into a server. And it ties back to that segmentation discussion we had uh, uh, earlier. So identity is super, super important. We're making big investments in it. Um, and it's going to become like it is, you know, you've heard the term identity is a new perimeter, right? Like it's, it's the yeah. thing that you trust. And then when, once they connect, if you can pass that identity along, then it doesn't so matter what the DMZ, what segment of the network they connected in, right? It's uh yeah, I love really what you're doing. You know, it's like we have kind of AI, we have a new framework, we have new infrastructure, you know, that's going getting in place. We're applying now uh, a much broader, deeper definition of identity um, so that we can even just mitigate um, attacks quicker, identify them, signatures yeah. of them and mitigate them, you yeah. know, quicker, you know, as well. I, you, know, you know, Tom, really great, great work, you know, in kind of driving this stuff into the uh, into the market through Cisco uh, right now. So, well, but I do want to go ahead. I'm go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, it's a, it's a pleasure doing it with the Onon community. Um, and Nick, I really appreciate it. Always love talking oh. to you and, and appreciate the support. You know, a lot of the things we talked about are pretty aspirational, right? Like the, like some hard problems that yeah. we got to go solve and it's going to take a while, but like the rate of change of, yeah. uh, you know, in the, the tools for a networking professional, the rate of change is, is it's, it's already underway, but it's yeah. staggering. The next two years yeah. are going to look nothing. Networking is going to look nothing like what it looked like in the past and having a group like Onug to help you navigate yeah. through those changes, I think is, is really, really valuable. Yeah. And that's huge because like there was a long period of time when we didn't really have, we had lots of tools and lots of companies, this tool sprawl as we know, mm -hmm. but you know, like everyone still relied upon ping, <laughs> you know, it's like, there's a, there's a lot you know, of incredible stuff is a little bit better than the thing that existed before. And, yeah. it, and it's it was, this, those three building blocks I talked about is creating an explosion in functionality. Yeah. It's not incremental. Firewalls that yeah. write its own rules and test its own rules. Like, you yeah. know, like for me to look at you and to be like, hey, we're going to permanently eliminate network outages due to misconfiguration. Not That's even practical a couple of years ago. Now I'm like, yeah, probably, you yeah. know, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty badass. Yeah. Well, I think this is like, um, you know, we kind of look at, you know, you know, all this, you know, kind of activity that's, you know, happening, you know, right now in the marketplace and what, and what you're doing, you know, as well. And you can see like, this is not a derivative, you know, of how we used to like build this infrastructure, uh, but it really is new, a new step function, you know, yeah. it's kind of a new day, you know, in this industry. And so, um, and it's really exciting, but I wanted to talk about uh, one, one, one more thing, because I know we're getting a little bit late and I don't want your family to get upset because I knew you're on vacation, Tom, you know, it's like, so I don't want to like, you know, Bogart, like, you know, your time. Yeah, so, on um, a beautiful day. Look out the window, my friend. It's like, oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was outside a little while ago. I'm like, oh my yeah. God, this is like great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I live in there. California, you know, Nick, but like, man, June, July and August, it's tough to beat Cape Cod. Yeah, it really is. I, well, it's we're lush. Yeah, you know, it's like there's yeah. just so much greenery, bright blue you know? sky, and like you know, just perfectly warm. Yeah, it's really it's 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 yeah. a pleasure. Yeah, no yeah. knock on California. California is beautiful, no. con, you know, Correct. beautiful. We state, love California, you know? but like, but like for three months out of the year, call me on the cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, all right, operations, yeah. knocks and socks. So yeah. now this goes back to like Splunk. Yeah. So. The one problem, uh, well, there's lots of problems. Like one big problem is that there isn't kind of a, a standard definition of data yeah. on how we take get data from yeah. an application and its dependency map. Yeah. So, uh, so Splunk could solve this problem, you know, by canonicalizing that, yes. you know, um, and for multiple different companies, obviously not just Cisco. So you really have a multi-vendor, yeah. you know, um, you know, yeah. deposit, you know, that's going data. pretty well. Right. You, you know, know, all the open yeah. telemetry stuff like that's becoming 
it's not really debatable. Like that's the standard now, right? Like, and everyone is, is, you know, if you're building a device and you're not supporting hotel, you are not paying attention. Right. So, so, so this, this is pretty big, big uh, improvements there. But the schemas are usually different though. Right. Yeah. So you still need to like, you know, map into a common schema. So yes. is, um, you know, are, is Cisco doing any work on that or you, will you rely upon Splunk that already did that, you know, frankly, yeah. you know, for the yeah. industry. That, that's that's where we see Splunk's value is like, it is the, the data platform that brings together observability and security. And yeah. so, so you know, Splunk's magic is that, it, that it, it can look across any system you can imagine yeah. and then tie this information together in a way that it becomes coherent, right? That's that's where like, it's, it's tough to match that in any other system. Splunk is amazing at that. For sure, um, yeah. And, yeah. And the intersection of security and observability is really cool, right? So like all that policy stuff that I talked about, one of the tools that we have that is really useful is Thousand Eyes. So Thousand Eyes yeah. is our, our network monitoring agent. And the, the yeah. idea behind the Thousand Eyes is we have lots of little observation points and then we kind of triangulate on where a problem is in the middle of the network. Mm -hmm. So we embedded that into our secure access system. So when we're doing uh, zero trust using the Cisco solution, you've got the Thousand Eyes agent built in. So this is not existing. For, what I'm going to tell you is something we're thinking about. I don't even have a clear roadmap for this, but I think it's really cool, which is if you go to make a policy change, yeah. we should be able to test it from that endpoint and say, you know, both positively and negatively, am I able to see the thing I thought I was, that I should be able to see? And am I seeing something I shouldn't see? Yeah. Right. And like, dude, we can do that in a really intelligent, dynamic fashion to always eliminate network outages. So security policies that are like, again, like highly automated, the operations team, you know, do, doesn't have to worry about making mistakes, but that same system can provide observability and be like, I'm noticing this app is suddenly running slow. Why? Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, it's going to be the like correlation. We're work, actively working on this stuff. Like it's, it's going to be very, very high impact for the operations yeah. teams. Very yeah. high. It's, it's got to be. And also just the, the efficiency that would be gained, like if we can um, kind of converge, you know, on both kind of knocks and socks, like, mm -hmm. you know, the last I saw, it was almost like 750,000 open recs worldwide for security engineers. And it's probably pretty close yeah. to like network engineers as well. Yeah. We're never going to, we're never going to have a pipeline big enough to fill all yeah. of those positions. And so it's yeah. got to come through automation. Yeah. So it's well, hundred percent, we hundred percent agree with that. And what's cool yeah. is, is, you know, we all have access to chat GPT and, mm -hmm. and, you know, you get on it and, and I think it's very easy to get it to do something stupid. Right. And so like as magical <laughs> as it is, it's like, you know, and it's like, Oh, and like the North pole is made of like frozen penguin urine. You're like, wait a minute, this thing is, you know, like darn it. The reason why I think chat GPT is, 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 is so amazing, but also I think it, it can be a little just dis disappointing is because it is an unbounded problem. You can ask chat GPT, what should I do in my life? I don't know the answer to that, you know, like, like, you know, and it's going to give you a plausible answer. Yeah. But if you constrain the thing to like, Hey, help me write firewall rules. Yeah. Dude, these AI engines are like way more accurate than humans. Yeah. Way, way, way more accurate than humans. So that's the thing from an operation standpoint is like, don't try to solve every problem, but if you constrain it to particular yeah. uh, problems, it, it's, you know, you, it'll earn your trust in very short order. And you're like, oh, cool. I don't have to like update my five tuple rule set anymore. And cool. Yeah. Every time I go to make an access control policy, I know that it's doing what I thought it was going to do because I'm verifying it end to end. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty amazing. Now in the security zone, you know, you already hit the nail on the head. Like the biggest issue is talent. People do not have experienced yeah. SOC analysts. They're really hard to come by. Yeah. And what we're finding is that if you use these AI agents, not to make security decisions autonomously, but to present information to an analyst so they can make decisions more effectively, it allows an analyst with one or two years experience to operate with the same effectiveness as an analyst with like five years experience. Yeah. So, and that's like, we have that running, right? So like, like yeah. we're pretty confident in those in, in that ratio. So it's, it, it doesn't, eliminate the need for humans, but it makes humans way more productive, yeah. way, way, way more productive. And I think it'll help alleviate that talent 
shortage that everyone has. Yeah, I, I think those are huge. Actually, that's a really insightful, um, you know, two points, you know, is uh, one is that like, you know, make the existing um, security engineers that you have more productive right. and more um, potent, you know, Fact, for lack yeah. of a better term, yeah, you know, perfect. yep. Yeah. yeah, you know, um, you know, and uh, and then also is that if we focus on the role of AI there is to just as we're doing in the broader industry, really focus on very specific tasks. And just like we do in management of people, you know, it's like you do a task, you observe, you know, how it does with that task, you get comfortable with it, you trust it, and then you give it more. And you, you know, just like, you know, where you're kind of you know nurturing, you know, a, a new employee. It's the same thing. You're just giving them more and more until like, you know, that that um, that um, uh, that responsibility set, you know, just grows. So I yes. think all that's those are really just two really insightful you know, observations. So, Tom, I want to end with maybe just one thing. And um, if we kind of take a look like over the next five years and we don't have to constrain it to our industry in general, but but overall, you know, so. Like it really, you know, just maybe just um, some food for fodder. Is that like um, one of the keynoters for um, the fall meeting in New York is Svi Gall. Um, Svi um, runs um, Memorial Sloan Ketting, um, you know, Cancer Institute. Yeah. Um, uh, he, their infrastructure. So he runs all, he's like their, he's basically their CTO. Yeah. And so he's, you know, and they're like, you know, the clearly top cancer research center, like, you know, yeah. a hospital research yeah. center in the world. Yeah. And so um, he's talking about the advances in cancer treatment and uh, yeah. cancer and drug discovery and yeah. so forth. And he like I was just talking with Svi like a couple of days ago and like Svi is like saying like within five years, not 15, not 50, but like in five years, you know, um, you may go into like a doctor for like your visit and he might give you or she, you know, might give you like two pieces of information. One is like, I got some bad news. And the bad news is you got your cancer. Uh, the good news, you're going to take these pills for like three months um, yeah. and your cancer will be cured, like cured, yeah. you know. Um, I am like so hopeful for that. You know, I just hope yeah. it's not hy hyperbole. Yeah. Um, but like coming from SPHE and from, um, you know, Sloan Kettering is... Yeah. has a huge yeah. amount of weight, you know, to it. Yeah. So yeah. I just kind of think about from the human condition yeah. um, and, and what our lives, you know, and our children's lives and yeah. grandchildren's lives will be like. And I think these next five, you know, to 10 years are going to be the most transformable we've ever experienced in our lifetime and maybe in world history. I, I don't I, know, I, but it's pretty exciting, it's, but you let to get your view. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I think you and I are very aligned here. So, so, like we live in a in a economy that's driven by knowledge work, right? And so yeah. so think about the things we just talked about over the last hour, like mm. the the human effort to program and update uh, the five tuple in a, in a rule set in a firewall, the human update to troubleshoot a network outage. All that stuff is 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 going to be replaced with computers, like in the next in months. Yeah, you pointed out it's not a decade from now. Like, like, mm. like I'm shipping a lot of this stuff and it, yeah, it'll take a while to get, gain the trust, but we're talking about months. Yeah. And so, and, and this is, this isn't just in it It's happening in every single domain. Like you said, cancer research, mm. uh, you know, accounting, right? Mm. Like, you know, your tax guy, you know, like a call center, like anything that processes information is getting this explosion of productivity. I, as an optimist, I'm like, oh my God, this is incredible. Like, we, like we, we're, we're going to have a, a surge in economic growth unlike anything we've ever seen before. Now, what's interesting is, you know, the economy is not just knowledge industry, right? So I'm like, wait, are farms going to get more productive? You know, are, like, is, is global shipping going to get more productive? I don't mm -hmm. know. It's kind of going the other way, you know? So it could create yeah. weird strains where the knowledge sectors of the industry are explosive and there's all this unbelievable value that's being created yet you know we we only grow the same number of years of corn and that, that you know um you know that'll create tension in society but ever the optimist i'm like yeah we'll sort that out like like this is going to be an amazing time to be alive i yeah. think so because yeah. stuff uh -huh. that was not possible in the past suddenly is yeah right yeah so yeah. excited yeah so i'm excited. I, i'm with you i'm like i i don't I'm kind of short and I'm kind of, my assumption is that like 
on the kind of the AI regulation stuff and the 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 concern about the downside. I'm glad people are worried about that. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. I'm, I'm more interested in like sure. the possibilities. Downsides. You know? It's for sure yeah. downsides. I think the upsides are like an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude great three orders right? you know like it's they're gonna eclipse the downsides and so for yes sure. let's be smart let's manage it intelligently etc like you know the, the bit about the, you know computers you know some killing people and stuff that's not good but 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 we'll find yeah. ways to to yeah. harness this stuff in productive and valuable uh, manner and it's gonna it's gonna be startling yeah it's yeah. great yeah. hey tom thanks so much for taking the time always fun enjoy the remainder of the day if you're able to get out today nick but, yeah uh, you will you. Yeah, yeah i will uh, thanks, I'm, I'm, thanks for chat, chatting with me. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Take thanks care. for joining. Yep. Bye.